console.time can be a convenient way to measure how long something takes in JavaScript. It measures the elapsed time between two points in your program and then prints the elapsed time to the console. You can even have multiple timers running at the same time. Let's take a look at this in action. So to demonstrate console.time, I have defined a very inefficient implementation of the Fibonacci sequence here. So this is using recursion and it's intentionally written to be quite slow so we can go and measure how long it's going to take. Now, the way console.time works is that you're going to make two calls and then it will measure everything that happens in between those two calls. To start up a timer, I'm just gonna call console.time. So I'll say console.time. And now we've started a timer and need to go and perform an operation. So here I'm going to go and call our fib function here and I'm gonna call it with, let's pass in 32 here. And now we need to go and end our timer and tell it the uh, engine here to go and print the elapsed time to the console. So for this, we're gonna use the console.time end function. So I'll say console dot time end. And now we are measuring everything that's going to happen between the call up here and the call down here. When I actually go and execute this, we can see that it is now printed out a value here to the console. And this is the elapsed time of the timer that we created up here. So we can see it's taking around 24 or so milliseconds for this single function call. Now we can use this to see how a larger number would go and impact our performance. So if we, instead of saying fib32 called fib35, you can see it's printing out a much larger number now because this function is now taking a longer time to evaluate with all the recursion that is going on. So we're very easily able to go and observe how long this function call is taking using the console.time function here. Now, a few things to note about using console.time. The first is that you can have anything in between the two calls to console.time here. So instead of having a single function call, I could have multiple function calls here. So I could say fib3. I could even have a loop if I wanted to and do all sorts of things. So you can have anything that you want in between these two function calls. And now it's gonna go and measure that. The other thing is that these two calls don't even need to appear in the same scope. So if I wanted to, I could even go and define a new function here. So let's just define a function foo. And that function is going to go and call time end here. And I'm actually gonna do that. And I'll say, let's do a call to foo down here at the bottom. And with our example, you can see that now console.time is being called in the top level scope here. It is then calling fib twice, and then it's calling the function foo, which is going to actually call console.time end. Whenever console.time end is called, it is going to end the current timer that is going. It does not need to be in the same scope. So this is going to work the exact same way as our previous measurement. This flexibility makes it really easy to go and measure different parts in your program because you don't actually need to make sure that everything is contained in a single scope. You can just add the console.time call and the console.time end call at any two points and measure the elapsed time between them. Now, one other neat trick with console.time is that you can actually have multiple timers going at the same time and also give names to what you're measuring. So let's go back here to one of our simpler examples. So we'll go for fib35 here. And again, we're gonna look at do the same calls here. So we're gonna say console.time and console.time end. But now for each of these function calls, we're going to go and give it a name or a label. So I'll say fib35 here. And then I need to give the exact same label down here on console.time end. So I'll say fib35. Again, I need to match the name that I'm passing in to console.time up above. After running this example, you'll notice that what has been printed to the console down here is fib35. So that is actually the identifier of the current timer that we gave to the call to console.time. So we could pass in any string that we want, and now it is going to display a more useful name when it actually finishes the measurement. The other neat thing about this is that we can have multiple timers all running at the same time. So here I'll go back to our example, and I'm just gonna change the first timer to A, and then I'm gonna start a second timer inside of this. So let's go down here, and we'll have a second timer that starts. I'm gonna call this timer B, and inside of that, I need to make sure I have a corresponding call to time end for our timer on B. And now I'll just go and add a second call to fib here. So now what we are doing is we are starting two timers. The first one starts up here and it measures everything down to the call down on the last line of our example. And then the second timer is going between these two points. And again, the key is that we're having the labels match up here. So A is going down to here and then B is going down to here. When I now run this example, notice how two things have been printed to the console. The first one that's being printed is actually B because that timer is ended first. So it is just measuring the points between this point in the program here, and it finishes first. And then A is measuring the entire duration of our entire sample here. So it is being printed after that, and it has a much longer duration. Using labeled timers like this makes it very easy to measure multiple different things in your program. And you can even give each timer a nice readable name so you understand what is being printed to the console. So that's a quick look at how you can use console.time to go and profile different parts of your program.